Hey there, Eddie Chi Rewired listeners. It's me, Eric. If you are by chance brand new to this podcast, this is the first time you've ever listened to an episode. This is not a normal episode. There's no uh, intro music. There's going to be no ads. Um, the usual intro and outro, we're not doing here. Uh, this is a bonus episode that I'm dropping in your feed. This is a uh, the audio from a webinar that we just did on April 1st um, with Diana Hager. She's a doctor, a medical doctor. Um, she's also a member of the ADHD Rewired community and alumni of uh, one of our coaching groups. And um, I'm just really grateful that she uh, she was able to spend an hour with us answering questions uh, from a lot of you. Um, she uh, she's very succinct. It was amazing how many questions uh, she was able to answer in in an hour. Um, unlike you know the Q and A's that that Brendan um, Han uh, and I do and I will curb um, where we maybe go on and on about certain things for a while. Um, she just got right to the point. So a lot of questions were answered. Very uh, some very practical questions um, to really help you understand what it is that you got, that you need to know. Um, so we, this is a webinar we call Facts, Fiction, and Fear, all about COVID-19. Um, so this is for educational purposes through a slightly ADHD lens. Um, so I do hope that this is helpful for you if you are have been completely inundated by this and you don't want to hear anything more about this right now. You don't need to listen. Uh, wait till next week or w- listen to a previous episode. Um, if, uh, if this is again, this is, this is your very first podcast listening. Well, welcome. Uh, this is unusual, kind of awkward, um, but I'm glad that you are here. So I know that uh Man, things have been just, they've been crazy. Um, I hope that you are doing all right and, and managing to the best that, that you can, giving yourself as much self-compassion as you can. Um, we have no experience on how to deal and how to adult with ADHD in a global pandemic where we have to practice social distancing. It is a type of foobar. It's something that we've never dealt with before. And man, I hope that we never will have to deal with this again. Um, but maybe we can take some lessons away from, from all of this. So, all right, this is the entirety of the intro. Um, that's all. Let's, uh, let me cue in the, uh, the webinar audio. I right, hope you enjoy. We'll get back with you next week with another regular episode. Um, oh, because it's officially Autism Awareness Month. So I think that's one of the episodes that we have queued up for uh, for uh, coming up. All right. I'm going to stop talking now. Enjoy this special bonus episode. I'm uh, Diana Hager, H-A-G-E-R. I'm uh, MD, trained in Oklahoma and then uh, intern in in uh, Spokane, Washington. Those are kind of my two localities I've lived and worked in the nation. Uh, I have, uh, for the last 10 years, per, uh, participated with, um, practiced in urgent care and primary care. I have a specialty in women's health, OBGYN, my first 15 years with over 3,000 deliveries and 5,000 surgeries. And now this part of my life, I'm taking it a little easier in the clinic. So how has um, COVID-19 been uh, impacting your your work? Uh, You know, for the most part, it's just the ambiguity of people who come in who are uh, ill, but you don't know how they're ill. We're not able to check and test. I am uh, starting a new job at an urgent care center, so I'll be starting that soon. I've actually spent more time sort of researching and studying uh, the virus and looking at the literature, we've had time to do that between jobs here. Okay. So what are, what are some of the things that, um, you think we need to know? I mean, we can start with, uh, we have a question from, uh, uh, Tara, who's asking, uh, what precautions would you recommend that someone with asthma, uh, take at this time? Good question. Cause I also have asthma. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, keeping your asthma as, stable as possible. And then, uh, you know, working closely with your healthcare professionals, really it's going to be telemedicine and on the phone. 
uh, they're trying to promote that. And as the days and weeks go by, I think we'll see more access to telemedicine and learn how to use that. And they're actually encouraging all seniors. So asthma would be along there too, as a high risk group to, uh, to not come into clinic, to visit by telemedicine, get refills that way. Um, when you're out, you're going to have to be out shopping, et cetera. All of us are, uh, there's been a controversy about mask. I think that it's, helpful for you not to pass the virus if you have it or if you have anything that you think might be that but with the asthma I would tend towards using a mask um I my thought is at least with the mask on your face you're not touching your face the viruses are going to be on surfaces all sorts of surfaces that they call fomites which might be handrails ATMs especially um etc so you got something on your face you're not going to be you're going to be more mindful of not touching your face. So I think the mask is going to, we're going to see it more and more. I went out yesterday and here we have just hundreds of cases so far, not thousands. Uh, but there was probably two or three people out of 50 that had their masks on in the grocery store. Um, another thing is gloves. I'm seeing lots of people wearing gloves, which is not necessary if you do your hand washing and hand sanitizing, which we don't have any access to hand sanitizers lately. <laughs> I've actually made up a recipe for one, so I can share that. But keeping her, her symptoms uh, controlled as much as possible and avoiding contact as much as possible. I get on, out only when she needs to. So if, if and when she is sick, then you know she knows it was under circumstances that couldn't be avoided. Mm. So um, there's another question here. Uh, one from Sandra says, I have a question. We've been holed up in our house for over two weeks, not going anywhere. We haven't had any symptoms, but we are concerned about spreading COVID-19 to our elderly parents who have diabetes. Since we have uh, self-isolated for so long, can we now be reasonably certain that we uh, definitely do not carry the disease? I I think reasonably certain, not absolutely certain, which is the worry and the fear. I have an elderly mother who's just gone through four years of stage four lung cancer and also has diabetes and is on oxygen, et cetera. And what I'm seeing at that, she's at a senior center. They are actually, uh, they've actually cut off people coming in and out now. But before that, say her parents live in their own home. Uh, I, one thing different that I'm seeing besides the hand washing is spraying the feet and shoes. So in these senior sitters, they're spraying the feet and shoes with Lysol spray, Lysol type of spray, or at a minimum, because now it's very difficult to get that, at a minimum, um, leaving the shoes outdoors or by the door and not walking around in, in the room with them. And then, you know, we're going to carry it in our hair, in our clothes. So going over when, you know, you're, re you're freshly clean with your hair and your clothing. Mm. But, I, you know, it's important to spend time with our seniors, but I, I had, you know, I minimized my time yesterday and just handed my, the groceries to my senior mom through the back sliding glass door. <laughs> and I'm that, then I'm wanting to say, throw the Walmart bags away. Don't keep them like you usually do. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's something I know that uh, I, I threw my bags away when we got some, uh, we got food delivered and now I can't even get food delivered. Like there's, there's not no, there's no delivery available. We don't have delivery, but we have pickup and even the pickup is, is blocked out for a week. So that's not, not an option. It's a good idea. Um, if you can uh, work from home entirely, would that be a good idea? I think I'd do that if at all possible yeah. or not work. I mean, I know there's sacrifices that are being made, but this is not the time to, to risk, take any risks at all. It's, I think as the week goes on, we're mm -hmm. going to see more and more personalized cases and more and more uh, illness and death that touch ourselves. And it's, it's going to be morbid. It's really going to be morbid. How important is it to avoid touching our face, which is a habit for many as we work from home on the computer? Oh, you don't have to worry about in your home, in your car. You're pretty much OK. You know, I, I'm speaking from the heart of the country, too, where we don't have a lot of virus. Right? We what, what state are you in again? Oklahoma. In Oklahoma. Okay. Um, we certainly have it and we've had deaths. We've, we've, we're only up to, I think, about 10 deaths or so, as opposed to hundreds elsewhere. Uh, but I've seen people in their car with their gloves and their face mask on. But in your car, in your home, 
you don't have to be as concerned about it. It's at, when you're going out um, and especially surfaces, which includes apparently the floor. <laughs> so such the shoes. Hmm. I don't even think I thought about the, the shoes. That's um... we have it medically. You know, when we think about things, it's masks and gloves, hats, they're, they're, I've heard a few comments that it is going to be in hair because the air droplets are, and you're out and exposed. It's in your hair. You're fairly safe. I think I saw people playing tennis, running, biking, um, those type of things. Uh, you're not, you're not going to be exposed to it just floating in the air in the fresh air. Like unless, that. You're, unless you're doing like riding your bike in the city. Yes. Okay. Um, we've been another question and uh, for everyone else who is here, if you have questions, please use the Q and a box to, uh, so we can feel those questions. Um, and if you're on uh, Facebook, we'll be uh, looking at those shortly as well. Um, how do you suggest that uh, we ask people to remain six feet away for social distancing? Some people just don't get it. Well, I think that people who live in a cluster, a family, in themselves, they don't need to be distanced. They're sharing each other's flora, viruses, et cetera. Now, if someone were sick, then you're actually kind of quarantining them away in a certain area of the home with just one person maybe shuttling back and forth. But when you're a husband, wife, when you're a family, when you're a mom and a child, there's not really social distancing. The social distancing is more uh, strangers, if you were have to go to a meeting, the six feet apart is their rule right now. And, you know, with all the advice and information, even the things that I'm saying, we're getting new information weekly, daily. So some of this information will change. They may change the six feet. You know, there was some rumors about 27 feet <laughs> that I saw Where did they come up with that? I don't that someone sneezed and they tracked it 27 feet. So Dr. Fauci, who's one of my uh, persons that I follow, Anthony Fauci, he caught on and, and dispelled that rumor and said still six feet. So we're getting correct and truthful information from the source, from the White House task force. I follow Johns Hopkins and their engineering department actually made up the first, one of the best and most used. It's called interactive uh, COVID-19 map. Have you seen that, Eric? I have. Do you want, you said uh, that you were going to share, do a screen well, share? I was going to try to, but I can't seem to do that. If you can do it. Yeah, you for sure. So I like to follow that. I mean, I have to keep myself from checking it several times an hour sometimes. <laughs> an hour. But, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think twice a day would be reasonable. And the things that I'm watching for on there is what's the percent of increase in the world in number of cases, number of deaths. We're seeing about a anywhere 10 to 15 percent rise in cases and in deaths. And that's that's keeping our curve going up. It's not getting much greater than that per day. So I'm watching that. I watch the deaths that are uh, important because, you know, there's. That helps you to know the number of cases in your in, in your neighborhood or your state. If you're not testing, which many our state is still not testing much, uh, they can they definitely can count the deaths and they definitely can count the hospitalizations. And so we get a truer number of truer uh, idea of what's on there. So up at the top left hand corner is the total per um, the world in cases, and then the white on the right white numbers are the total deaths it's listed by countries but the u.s is divided into states so it's hard to see where the u.s is there if you go down it's more granular regions and then over in the green on to the right of that is the um recovered early on and currently with the process they're only considering for the most part recovered people who uh, test negative twice after having it so originally to even release people from the hospital they would have them or release them even from a self-quarantine they'll have them test twice uh, negative but if you go back over to the left on the red numbers and the, we're on the top the u.s has the most uh, cases now was china for so long and click on the u.s then your numbers change. So we're, we had 46, so the deaths went from 46,000 to 4,500. So we have 10% of the deaths in the world. And then you can go down. It's, again, I, some of it, it's not really by 
um, state. It's by regions within a state. So if I want to know about Oklahoma, I have to blow up the map. Can you like expand the map? All right. All the dots are just counties. So now they've taken it on a granular level down to counties. And if you can, you look in your county. We can look. At some. So it says uh, uh, forty four thousand four hundred ninety six confirmed. 60, and 60 deaths. Uh-huh. And then 4,436 uh, active. So that's, I mean, I'm trying to do this off the top of my head, but it sounds like about a one and a half percent death rate, which is about right. That when you get to some counties, you see 10% death rates, 5% wow. death rates. You know, they're not testing all the people in your um, area because they're going to have pretty close to a 1% death rate. So, but it's not, it's not by town though, it looks like, cause I'm, you know, I'm in Glenview. No, it's so not by okay. county, it's by county. Okay. Wow. That's something. Yeah. It makes it challenging because you can't, now in your state, you can look at your state um, government information, usually the health department, they'll have some statistics for your state and then divided by counties. And then they'll divide that by uh uh, the deaths, they'll divide the deaths up by the age of the deaths, which we know is for the most part over 70 years old for the, uh, but some are going to be younger. The thing with this virus is people are getting sick about anywhere from one day to a little over a week into exposure. They have our young people, our age range people. I, I call myself young. I guess I'm 58. Uh, young at heart. Our, yeah, this middle middle group um, will have somewhat mild symptoms, scratchy throat, minimal cough, and that will kind of go and change a little bit daily. Viruses tend to change symptoms every two or three days. Mm. You've kind of got something a little bit different as opposed to bacterial infections like a tonsillitis with strep is going to stay the same. Throat, 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 but it changes its throat, some nose, a little cough. It's really infecting the lungs and the heart. So they're even in the young people who have it and it passes, they uh, recover from it. It's, they're going to have some chest pain, some lung pain, some chest pain. Uh, it's not until about 10 days into symptoms. So sometimes two weeks or more after you've been exposed that they really d- deteriorate if they're going to. Mm-hmm. So they've had people who have symptoms stay in for 14 days. And it's about that 10 to 14 day uh, time that they begin to decompensate with their breathing. And it's obvious. It's not uh, questionable. You're not going to doubt. Um, you, you just really, really have trouble breathing with lots of chest pain. I've heard it. I've heard it described as like having shards of glass in your lungs. Yeah. Oof. Um. So for those of us who take medication and have to go to the pharmacy on a monthly basis to get their refills, um, one of the things that I did when I picked up my last uh, 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 prescription is I go through the drive through with with gloves on. And then the way our like the, the setup of our store is then you have to go um, after you leave the drive through the sort of like an alley that you drive through with has dumpsters. So I actually like just parked right in front of the dumpster, tore out, tore the packaging that it was, that was yeah. in through, through all of that away. And then when I came home, I like wiped down the bottles. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. The other thing I noticed yesterday when I had to do a pharmacy run for my mother is they didn't take the card. They actually had you read the card number off to them. Mm. So that's, that seems sensible too. So it's, it's funny too, cause <laughs> it's going to seem like the things that I almost think are over the top and neurotic seem to actually be good ideas. Right. Exactly. Now at some point we're probably, most of us are going to get it, but you know, let's try to get it when the healthcare system can support us. I think. All right. So uh, we have another question here. Um, uh, my partner works. Uh, I am not uh, in installing air conditioning. How can he better protect himself when going to clients' homes? I think um, again, I mean, you know, for one thing, I don't think it would be unreasonable to ask them: Is anyone symptomatic? Does anyone have fever, cough, mm. et cetera, in the home? Um, I think he could screen himself that way pretty easily. Now, when he's up in the attic outdoors on working on the areas he's not as um, exposed as he is face to face with people and then keeping his distancing I would use I would go ahead and use a mask um, 
gloves, even if he wore his work gloves would be perfectly fine. And maybe even shoe covers if you can find them. But okay. at, at least having his work boots, that's what I do with my husband. They would the work boots stay ho- close to the back door. And then we use indoor shoes in the house. I know when I, uh, when I come in, so, so, um, my office is a, it's a small office. Not a lot of people use it. Um, so right now it's just in me and, and Barb. So it's, we, we are keeping our distance, but it's like our, our coming in routine is we're like Lysoling, wiping things down. Like, even though it's just been us that's here, we just, you know, just in case right, someone was here at night. Like, practice. Um, and so like when I, if I'm wearing gloves, I'll come in and I'll lay the gloves on the counter and I'll spray my gloves with Lysol. Mm-hmm. Cause then I was thinking, right. cause I was putting my, my gloves in my pocket. And I was like, Oh, well, I could have just, just contaminated my right. pocket. And it's <laughs> like, Oh my God, it's, it's crazy making. Yeah. It's crazy making. I mean, but I think the more we get, the more we do it, we'll, we'll get used to it. And it may go on, this may go on as far as protecting ourselves for months to a year. Maybe this will instill some better hand washing techniques and just people in general. I think there's definitely going to be some, you know, before and after the virus habits, social, um, socializing is going to be different. And maybe and, changing how people say, oh, it's just a cold. Cause like I always mm-hmm. hate when people say it's just a cold because colds yeah, are miserable. Yeah, my allergies. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like just a cold, stay home then. Um, all right. Uh, so Natalie asks, what is your opinion on homemade masks? People are making and donating masks to hospitals who are running out of PPE. Um, these masks don't have the same filters. Is it worth Uh-oh. wearing fabric masks other than the fact uh, it helps you not touch your face, particularly in medical environments? I think it, you know, just a simple flimsy homemade mask will be the last resort. There's some things you can do to inc- improve uh the protectability of it, double or triple layering it, uh, putting the batting in like a quilt batting. I noticed that our, one of our furniture stores is using their mattress, um, what they use for their mattress covers to make masks out of. So interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. What other kind Uh, of materials can be used? I I think the tighter the weave, the better. And then the, the looser the weave, the more layers that they need. Now, other materials, what have I seen? I, I saw this is not something that everybody can do, but in Billings, Montana, where I follow, because that's where my son lives, the doctors came up with a they made a 3D um, form fitted mask out of plastic, out of a 3D printer. And then they just have to change the filter out of that. But huh. it takes the time to print the, you know, the 3D mask. But they are using 3D printers for the visors to make the visors and to make some of the masks now. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, I saw something about they said, and this is probably one of the the uh, the, the ideas that's maybe just a bunch of baloney, um, or you could take like a like a scarf and then put like alcohol on the scarf. So if you're breathing it in, you're actually breathing in alcohol, which could then kill any virus. Like, is any of that sound? Yeah, but it's not gonna. I mean, that'd be the same as just drink alcohol (laughs) or snort it. Um, No, I don't think that's going to work very well. There's, I've seen several people have run by me, uh, communication sent out, and it'll usually start the myth ones. We usually start with this. I got this from a friend of a friend or a very close relative friend, and then they list about. 25 different things to do, including only drink hot water, never drink cold. And all of those are out the door is as hydrated as you can stay. Um, and the, the more mu- uh, moist mucous membranes help to fight off any virus and would help to, and if we can get the virus and just let our immune system click in without being sick, that'd be optimal. So another, another thing is vitamin C in the ICUs in China and then here too, they're using actually thousands of milligrams of vitamin C IV. And mm. it's not the only thing, but I think staying up with your vitamin C, which is usually a thousand milligrams a day, but now I think I do one to 2,000 twice a day. Talk about the importance of sleep because as oh in our gosh. community, <laughs> yeah. we're like all of our structures and routines have been just pretty much obliterated. So, um, I mean, I know I've been staying up later. Uh, and so just talk about the importance of sleep with this. I think the importance of sleep is the time that you sleep, getting your good sleep in. And I've even found myself cause I, you know, sleep has been one of my things and I've 
worked on it. But I find myself, I mean, my I'm going in third gear, fourth gear, when I should be in neutral, laying down, trying to get to sleep. And it's um, it's really been impossible some nights, you know, processing this information to get to sleep. So I think when you can sleep and then get your full amount of sleep that you feel comfortable and rested with is going to help your immune system the most. The other, you know, along with that is anxiety and the fears, you know, trying to do the things that are self-comforting to you, self-soothing to you to to reduce the anxiety and fears as much as you can, because that, that plays a factor as well. All right. What another question. Uh, I live in so sleep when you can. Yeah. Yeah. Sleep when you can. I live in New York city. I need to go to the grocery store, but I don't want to bring COVID-19 back with the groceries. I heard you recommend uh, hand washing and using Lysol on the shoes. And of course there's social distancing, but which of these additional uh, five things would help. A, cover my hair while I'm out. B, rinse off all the groceries. C, throw out uh, the bags. D, throw out throw out all my cl- oh, throw all my clothing in the laundry before I enter the house. Um, do you recommend any other things I should do uh, for my grocery trip? I mean, that sounds you know pretty. Um pretty regimented, pretty strong. I, people are covering their hair, like we said. Uh, they are recommending that you wipe down, wash down, rinse off your groceries, even individual, you know, bananas, things that have peels on them. Um, so it's a routine. What about eating apples that have uh, exposed skin? They're washing them or peeling, and, and you don't have to peel them, but washing them at a minimum very, very well. Yeah, how do you wash food like that? I wash food like that just with warm water and I use my scrubber, like a vegetable scrubber or a dish scrubber and just scrub along it just to kind of get it good and scrubbed down. Um, some of the berries and such, it's always been um, recommended that using a mild vinegar solution that will actually kill even the funguses that make them go bad earlier. Oh, interesting. Okay. I, I'm working on that one though, because <laughs> I, I haven't got to the point where it doesn't taste like vinegar yet. Oh no. More and more dilute. I think I saw something a while back that said you're, you'll keep your berries longer if you put them in their microwave for like three seconds when you first got them or something like. Really? I, oh, that might do something to the, it's funguses that, you know, tend to creep up on them within just a few days. Um, but what about, so I know that, that some people, when they get their groceries, they take out, out before they bring them into the house, they kind of take them out of all the, like the box, the boxes and the, uh, so like a cereal Containers. box. Yeah. Just take the, take the, you know, just. If you can, I mean, I think that's going the extra mile. Um, but if you can, that would be optimal, especially in this early days. And then especially as we're kind of ramping up with it over the next couple of weeks, I don't think, I think there are, some of these things will be able to relax as the months go by. Mm -hmm. Um, How could you think that we could prevent ourselves from getting bored to death? Oh, bored to death. And it's just, I mean, it's, you know, I think if there's any community where that's actually not funny or it's actually a serious, you know, it's ours. (laughs) It's a health hazard. You know, because we, we, we don't, we don't, you know, (laughs) we don't suffer boredom very well. I think, you know, social media now, we, we always wanted to limit social media before, but I follow certain people that I like their recommendations, certain authors. Like I like Liz Gilbert. I like Glennon Doyle and uh, her wife, Amy Wombat. I like, there's some ministers that I like to follow. Um, there's exercise people I like to follow. I, there's certain Instagram influencers I like to follow. and right now they're saying give yourself a break you know we're processing we can't see it we can't feel it but we're processing this tragedy every day and that takes downtime for your mind and your brain and you know i i've followed you book recommendations listen to audio books the things that i like to do i need to move more i know and uh, probably walk my dog more <laughs> You would appreciate that. But I think um, having things that you, in projects, coming up with projects, not that you're going to be an overachiever, but just little things that you wanted to get done that you just haven't done. Those things have helped me at least. But I've, I've definitely suffered the boredom to the point you just feel like there's an engine running in you that can't be stopped. 
Yes. Meditation helps when I really get ramped up. I think the meditation helps tremendously. And so if you haven't gotten that habit started, then I think this is a very good time. Um, are there some more questions? Um, are there any graphs that show if we are slowing the spread or how effectively we are, are spreading the, the virus? Yeah, and that, that's the Johns Hopkins graph. Also, if you follow a state, check out your state health department and they'll let you know the percent per day. So our percent per day for increased numbers, increased number of cases is run about 10 to 15 percent. And I think in Italy, when it was at its worst, they were running 20 percent. I just kind of click those numbers in my calculator each day to see that as we start to slow, we're going to come down below 10 percent. Um, that's going to be not very uh, pertinent to states who don't have many right now. Uh, it's going to be more pertinent to the states who are getting overwhelmed. Like, but see, you can see that it's just going up, up, up. W- when we start to get below 10% and we're falling more and more below 10% a day in change of cases and in deaths, then we're going to see it start to flatten out. Mm. But we're probably not at the peak yet. We're, we're not. We're still running. It's, it was 10% again. Yesterday, 10 to 14 percent. When I look at different, some states, we're up to 14 percent and 15 percent. Mm. All right. Uh, let's see. Next question. Um, HEPA filter material from vacuum bags have been used. I guess that wasn't a, su- yeah. a question, but a, a suggestion. Um, yeah, I, that's a good idea. And, you know, I got one of the N95. Actually, I have a relative who had. Uh, half a dozen in 95 masks in their garage for household work, painting and plastering, et cetera. And they have a little filter. I'm trying to figure out how to get that thing out of there, but that would be good uh, to be able, because it's just got a little, not quite one inch disc. The rest of it um, is, seems more durable. But if I could get that little filter out, but that's a good idea to have the filters in vacuums and things like that. But if someone has like, say a bandana, is that kind of useless? It would be on the lower end of the spectrum as far as usefulness. I mean, I think that it'd be at a minimum helpful. And again, it's that something's on your face. You you asked about how could we reduce or how could we not touch our faces? And I think it's impossible. Even 15 years ago, they did a very large study and they actually studied how many times people touch their face. It's over 200, almost 300 times a day that we inadvertently touch our face. Mm. So it's going to be impossible for us not to do that. If we had, if we're in an environment, like say the grocery store, the bank, the pharmacy, where we're worried about at least having the mask, then having the gloves, you're going to notice when your eyes start itching. Mm. <laughs> you're going to be looking for something else to do. Uh, here's another question. Is it totally ridiculous to consider buying a biohazard suit uh, and masks for the next time a pandemic happens? Like, what if there's an Ebola pandemic? Oh. <laughs> I, I, you know, I haven't done that personally. I haven't uh, gone to that extreme personally, but, you know, it, we don't know what's going to happen. Have you ever considered doing that? Maybe for work purposes, <laughs> but not for home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for work purposes. Okay. Uh, also, the use of a hair dryer in your face to kill the virus. Is that a the thing? heat? Yeah, the heat. Well, you, uh, there's two things. There's the heat, and then there's the airflow. The water is going to be the best. So the the water and the flow of water, and the more time that you can splash and flow water on your hands, your face, your body, the better. Um, but I don't, don't think the heat's going to reliably get rid of it. I know that soap kills viruses on my body. Could I wash most other things with soap too and avoid disinfectants? Yes. Yeah, I actually, I actually started uh, washing my apples with just a little bit of, like, I take a, a small towel and a little bit of, of Dawn soap, Dawn, um, yeah. and uh, which I never thought I would ever do, but it's like, it, it rinses right off though, so it's... Yeah. Does it get the wax off of them? I know if you, for the, the, so silly, they put wax in apples just to make them look shinier. Um, but if it's a little bit of hot water, uh, mm-hmm. can work too. So it'll melt right off. Um, all right. So we got that one. Um, now, you know, Eric, as we know more and more about the virus, there may be information that heat does help. Uh, but right now it doesn't look like a blow dryer heat or, uh, 
that type of heat is going to help the virus. What about the recommendation I've heard about uh, gargling with salt water when you come home? The salt water, it's just like the nasal lavage, the where you, you know, blow the water in and rinse it back out. You're going to rinse out allergens. You're going to rinse out bacteria. You're going to rinse out virus. It doesn't quote kill it, but you're certainly actually rinsing that out of your oropharynx. So I mean, it's not going to be, it might help you 40, 50%. Okay. Um, let's see. So you mentioned something that I'd like to you'd expand on. Uh, she mentioned having differences in behavior for months to a year. Is this something others are also saying? It is the question, how long do we think this is going to happen or how are we going to do with it for months to a year? <laughs> I think the latter. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we're going to have to individually work on and get information from other people on and and you know the news information is the worst information to get it seems like um like i said i'm targeting who i like give me information uh, by using the people that that i know fairly well the authors the ministers the people that i'm familiar with and know so i'm using those people to give me ideas and and they have i mean this week <laughs> i learned to make a um, cake and mix in a mug, like from scratch. <laughs> cake and to mix me, that's in like a mug. Fun. A chocolate cake in a mug. And you mix like your three tablespoons of flour, three tablespoons of sugar, cocoa, uh, vanilla, mix it up. There's some oil and egg and you throw it in the microwave and you have a what? cake. In a mug. <laughs> that's the pioneer women. Wow. Um, that sounds amazing. Whoever thought you can make a homemade single serving cake? Yeah. Wow. Our um, next question is, how can you tell, looking at uh, a, a death rate of, say, 10%, whether that's due to inf- insufficient testing or a medical system overwhelm? You can't, other than to know some of the quality of what you're looking at. So that's what they're thinking in Italy. Their death rate has been 8 to 10%, and they think that it was as much overwhelm as it was testing and it's probably a little bit of both and how much of both you can't know um like here i know we're not testing i have uh, family members who had symptoms and went into their doctor got an inhaler and ibuprofen and this was actually on the military base the testing sent, uh, tent was right outside but they were they were uh, denied testing because they hadn't been in contact with a known person with the virus or been out of the country. So the, the testing is definitely, definitely inadequate. I think it's going to ramp up where it's going to be just available for pretty much anyone who wants it. Then the next level is going to be testing for the antibodies. And that's where they're going to be discovering who's immune and who's not. So each month that we go by, whether you even know you have it or not, more and more people, even yourself, more and more chance that you're going to be immune to it. And that's sort of the novel part of this. When it came out, no one, no human had ever been exposed. So everybody's vulnerable all at once. Hmm. Um, All right. When do you think our local governments will start to open up mass testing with people who don't have symptoms? It may even be a month, really. I mean, they, they kept promising, you know, next week, next week, next week, they've got a supposedly five to 15 minute test, but that just hit the FDA and got approval. Once that comes out, then they'll, but even the clinics, they don't want people in there who they think have it to test. So they, Mm. they guide them to their health department to get the testing. I've been just Googling for our state and it's been a week now. They keep saying that the universities, uh, there's two Tulsa and Oklahoma city are the large uh, cities here in the Oklahoma University is in the city area, and then Oklahoma State University Medical Center is in Tulsa area. So they're supposed to set up tents, but it's not materialized. It's materializing, but it's not materialized yet where people can go through and get tested. So you can actually see, if you look at your state health information, it'll show you how many people they've tested. Like if we have 600 in the state and they've only tested 1,000 people, you know, <laughs> yeah, so the numbers are probably way higher than what is being reported. Exactly. Exactly. Very, mm. very high, much higher than what we think. And mm. then that's where I think that the the next phase of the antibody test to see, which there's, they can do by a blood draw takes weeks to get the results, but they're coming up with trying to get a finger stick 
where you can just finger stick and know pretty much right away. Oh, wow. um, do you seem to have the antibodies? Huh? How are you? Uh, what What are you seeing from kind of your your colleagues? Like, how are they? Uh, how, like, are they practicing in a different way? Are they? I mean, I have to imagine. I mean, they're on from the front lines, and you're on the front lines of all this. That's, yeah, that's... I, I think especially I have a, a nurse practitioner friend who's been relocated from her hospital site to a homeless and testing. And so, you know, when you know you're in a higher risk level, it's amped up, your hair's covered, your face is covered, your mask, et cetera. But it's, it's so uncertain. You just, to some point of degree, you just have to let go of the fears because everybody we see almost is coughing as a sore throat, hurting in their chest. Mm. Now, when they look at, you can look at the number of tests done versus the number of positives and other people who think they have symptoms or who, quote, qualify for testing, still only about 10, maybe approaching 20% in some areas are positive. So 80 to 90% of the time, if you thought you needed a test, you would be negative. Mm. So it's, it's a pretty large amount though, still. Yeah. Um. Another question. My friend's sister in New York City wants a doctor to check out a breast lump she found a couple of weeks ago. But patients uh, who go to the hospital are coming back infected and telemedicine doesn't seem to be a good solution. What should someone do if they have an urgent medical concern like this and they live in a hot zone? Hmm. I think um, probably the best solution, if she has a physician she's been to before, even if it's a general practice physician, talking with the nurse at the clinic. The nurse has seen so many cases like this and can give you some information she may uh, say based on your age. Let's not, you know, let's just check it, wait and check and, and continue on. They may actually have you describe the lump. Um, it's not a good idea right now. And it's actually, they're shut down for any cancer screening. Um, they will do no cancer screening right now. Was you know, whatsoever. Wow. Hmm. Now that's not particularly screening, that's diagnosing something that's there. But if you don't have a physician, I think uh, checking a breast uh, clinic, breast surgeons, staff, so call and let them know, you know, you don't want to go in and talk with the, one of the nurses or the manager and just let them know and, and get, it'll help give you reassurance too, uh, to kind of have that professional touch point. Hmm. Um, are immunity boosters worth it as an overall preventative, I think measure was the word that might've been left off. Yeah. <laughs> they may or may not help. They don't hurt. Um, so, I mean, like you said, the best is going to be your sleep, your stress, good nutrition, um, not smoking. Those type of things are going to be the, the best you can do. And then the vitamin C is one of the best immunity boosters, if, if any. I think my uh, my doctor has said that he doesn't really like vitamin C like supplements. He's like, just get it straight from the source. Um, yeah, I get I take get lemon or lime every day in something, mm. whether I cook with it or drink with it. I still take vitamin C. Okay, but for the most part, I'm pretty religious. I had actually for from about 2003 to 2007, I got pneumonia every January. I got sick, got a wow. virus, got pneumonia, and I tried it. One year, I tried. I'm going to do vitamin D because it's in the winter. I bet it might be vitamin D. No, that didn't work. It wasn't until I really got religious with the actual source from the source vitamin C, and I just have them throw a lemon in a tea or lime in water, lemon or lime, and they're mm. cheap. Yeah, they're like you know, three for a dollar. At the grocery store. <laughs> all right. Here's another question. Uh, it seems to me that all of my neighbors are staying indoors and just going outside to walk with social distancing or going to stores. Uh, since the numbers keep rising, does this mean that the recommendations that we are receiving aren't enough? Could we be picking up the virus in the street, for example, on our dog's paws and our shoes and clothes uh, from aerosols? That's a good question. The, the thing to realize is the people who have been sick since over the last two weeks we've been social distancing, they were exposed in late February and early March. So the people are going to get sick this week. We're not exposed till early March to mid-March to the social distancing started. So we haven't even seen the graph reflect social distancing. 
and we may not because we not only have social distancing, we have an uptick in the numbers. So the uptick in the numbers and the social distancing may just somewhat cancel each other out. We may not see that. But once we start getting more tests and everything, can't we use like statistical modeling to be able to see like, yes. if, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, my, uh, my eight year old son, um, was, uh, I guess read an, an article that his school gave him, uh, cause he's doing the distant learning now. Um, talking about, um, the coronavirus through the lens of the virus. And uh, this virus is very proud of itself for being a very successful virus, one of the most successful of all time, um, because one of its superpowers is it infects people and they don't know. That's interesting. And I thought it was a really interesting That's a very perspective. Interesting take. You know, we think of it as a thing, as a living organism. All it is is just a strand of genes, of genetic material inside of a protein capsule it has this is nothing else than that it has these little those little notches on the outside that can hit the receptors they they attach to what we call a ace ace receptors on the throughout the oral pharyngeal especially the lungs and the heart and some in the gi tract as well mm -hmm. but uh, it's it, it's more like a parasite a genetic parasite than anything else mm -hmm. Um, next question is, could you explain what it means when the percent per day changes? Why is 10% an important number to pay attention to? I kind of came up with that on my own as I watched as Italy was ramping up with their numbers and then Europe ramping up with their numbers before they even, and actually the first two weeks of your social distancing, your numbers are not going to reflect the social distancing at all again. But when they were at their most, they were ramp they were going up 20%, whether it's the number of cases or the number of deaths, about 20% a day. They began to track back down by, by the time we're getting it to 10%. And we're, we are up kicking up to 10%. And hopefully, at least if you see that, you can compare day to day. Are you over or above what you've been seeing? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me. I, uh I don't know if it makes sense to, to Blake with the, uh, <laughs> the question. Um, what about mail? How are you recommending handling mail? And like uh, uh, deliveries from like Amazon and stuff like that. Yeah, I've seen people with their Amazon deliveries clear, opening up, getting them out of the boxes with their gloves on the porch and throwing out um, the remains. And I even saw someone on the news that was letting it sit for 24 hours on their porch after they opened it up. But and then cleaning it off again and bringing it in, you know, I haven't gotten my mail all week. So <laughs> now, is that a typical thing for you, or is that uh... <laughs> it's close to typical? It's probably been a little longer, but I would think I would. You know, you could handle it with with gloves, I guess, and then uh, toss out. I I wouldn't even open the junk stuff. I don't usually anyway. I just toss it. And... So can I can I ask you a personal question? Sure. So as a, uh, a doctor with ADHD, how is this sort of like, how is ADHD um, showing up for you with, with all of this? Oh, that's, that's a good question. It's symptoms are definitely more noticeable, more frequent and more intense. It's all just ramped it up to the point that uh, it's probably as intense as it's ever been. I think trying to keep us that thought going streaming has been difficult uh, trying to remember, you know, all those little forgetful things. Why did I go to the other side of the house? It's like constant. And then the inability to, you know, not inability, but the problems with trying to relax and come down from, you know, just a really wired state that I can get myself into. Are you having a hard time sort of disconnecting from it? Yeah, I am. But I think, you know, I'm just watching programs, um, like I said, going over the social feeds of those that, you know, I find most trustworthy and meditating. I, I actually started meditating and it was due to this program, probably about 2015 or 16, I think. Um, so now my little counters go up to like 10,000 minutes of meditation. Wow. So I'm, I'm getting That's there damn good. It. I know, right? This is surprising. I mean, it's counted it, so. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, what are what are some common things that maybe you've heard that um, people are doing that 
are kind of like BS, ridiculous myths, like stuff that I oh from the first the very first thing was the buying of the toilet paper. <laughs> that was the most ridiculous thing in the world. I even googled why are people <laughs> hoarding toilet paper, and it comes up into more your arena as a psychological reasons. I came up psychological reasons that they couldn't control this information that's coming in. They couldn't control what's happening, but they could control how much toilet paper they have. So <laughs> I saw a, uh, I saw a thing on, uh, I think it was on Costco's website that says like, we were, we are not accepting returns of toilet paper, paper towels, <laughs> like, which is really interesting. Cause people are probably like, crap, I bought way too much toilet paper. Like this is silly. And they're probably feeling bad and want to like get, put it back into the, the <laughs> distribution. And but they're like, no, we can't take it back now because of, yeah. uh, of the safety of yeah. it. But I think, you know, the the other thing was the article that was sent to a family member about not drinking, uh, only drinking hot fluids. And you had to do it four times an hour, all waking day long. And then even if you got up in the night heating something and drinking something hot and steamy and then eliminating all your cold or ice drinks. And, and this person was like, I, I love my I, my cold water all day. <laughs> so it's just staying hydrated is the point. So do you think that we're going to also have a uh, return of this in the fall? I kind of think it's not going to obey. I mean, I think it's going to rise and then it's going to level out. Um, I don't, I don't know that we're going to get a, a series or a cycle of it. I think it's just going to continue and we're going to just get more and more people immune. Yeah, we should reach an immune, unlike the flu, which our immune system cannot recognize the next season. This one so far, it looks like the immune system recognizes it for at least two years. And looking at the SARS, looking back at SARS is where they get that for a COVID virus. The, um, the immune system does seem to recognize it. And that depends on the amount of genetic mutation. So it's a little strand of DNA or RNA. It's an RNA virus. Um, the genes on it, on a flu virus can mutate even within uh, two weeks that a person's ill it mutates to the point your immune system doesn't recognize it. And so once you're recovering from the flu, three weeks into symptoms and you're recovered, it hits you again. So you sort of get this cycle with it. Mm. So your immune system picks it up the second time and the third time quicker, and you're not quite as sick, but people will feel like they've been sick all winter with the flu. Whereas with this one, it's not mutating that fast. It's only mutating about 10 to 15% per month. And it's not mutated so much that it it, it is confusing the immune systems. Uh, a question about that came in. Uh, why is the mutation rate lower for coronavirus? I It's just a different virus. I'm not sure why. I can't tell you why. You haven't been able to ask the virus. <laughs> that, uh, what about I'll, um, I'll what about babies? Are babies safe? Babies, babies are in a vulnerable position. So far, we haven't seen a lot of positives on infants. Uh, and, you know, of course, we're only testing if they have symptoms. Same with children. So we're thinking that the children and the infants are getting the virus but not having symptoms. Mm. Therefore, they're asymptomatic carriers. And that's one thing, you know, one uh, reason to keep those, uh, the kids away from the older people. Probably why. But yeah. if an infant were to get it and go into that, you know, 10 days into it where it then affects the heart and the lungs, it's, it's not going to be good. And I think that's, that's going to happen much, much less than 1% of the time for children and infants. What about uh, expecting mothers? The baby, actually, this is my expertise. The baby has the mother's immune system for the first four to five months of its life. That's why you don't see them getting sick or sniffles or uh, illnesses until about four or five months of life. So even if the mother had the COVID, the COVID hasn't, and we know from other coronaviruses in the past, which are basically thought to be cold viruses, uh, they don't affect the fetus or the baby at all. And then once the baby's born, if the mother's had it, then the baby will be immune to it at least until the mom's immune system begins to wane at four to six and seven months, and then the baby's gaining its own immune system. So at least in that very vulnerable first part of the life, the immune system is covered by the mother. And breastfeeding has the immunoglobulins that are better than any antibiotics for uh, especially oral pharyngeal things. Wow. 
So this has been, uh, you know, um, not fully ADHD related, but we're all affected by this. I mean, it's, it's, um, so I really appreciate that you're, you came on here to, to share your, your sort of wisdom and, and answer these questions. Um, is there, are there any, is there anything else that you wanted to share? Uh, we're at the, the, just past the top of the hour here. Um, not really. I mean, I think, uh, filtering where you get the information. The news sources are sensationalizing. I do better if I just watch the White House task force talks, even if they're an hour to two hours long, because they're taken out of context when they replay them on the news. Well, Dr. Heyer, thank you so much for, for coming on and uh, it's good, good seeing you again. Helpful. Yeah. But I'm already seen comments about how it's been, been helpful. So, uh, Thank you. Cause it's, you know, there's so much information out there and it's, it is hard to know kind of what, what's legit. Um, we almost need a health coach these days, even when before this, all the dietary nutrition information, fitness information is so confusing to, to decipher. You get total extreme opposites of information. Thank you so much for spending the hour with us. And this has been very You're helpful welcome. for the community and uh, stay healthy and sane. Okay. <laughs> all right. Be well. Thank you so much.